Welcome everyone, I'm Noam Unger. I'm Vice President for uh, Development Policy Advocacy and Learning here at Interaction. I see a lot of faces that I know around the room, but there are also some faces that I do not know, so it's very nice to see you all. Um, we're really uh, pleased to be able to host uh, our colleagues from USAID uh, who work day in, day out on, uh, on data issues uh, for the agency. Uh, we have with us today Brandon Trusowski, uh, who is the Chief Data Officer for the agency, and his team, and I'll allow him to introduce uh, the folks who have come with him today. Um, my understanding is that you guys are about to go live with some stuff that you're really excited about soon, and that we get uh, a bit of a, of a preview and to really engage you in discussions. This is not the, by any stretch uh, for folks who may not have uh, been in interaction meetings throughout the process, the first such discussion that we've had as a community um, back in 2014 and even earlier, there were just major efforts uh, in sort of going back to the last administration around data policy, really across government as a whole. And then for USAID in particular, uh, Brandon has been involved uh, very closely uh, with all of that as of his, his team and, uh, and Gail uh, looking at it from the legal standpoint. Uh, our community uh, has also, as a, as a community of, of NGOs uh, and actors in this space, been wrestling with similar phenomenon just around the use of data and, and information sharing. And as with any of these things, there's always uh, legal, ethical, moral, you know, access, transparency issues abound. Um, and uh, these guys are here to tell us how they've worked it all out. <laughs> so, um, but we're, no, we're really looking forward to hearing from you. And uh, my sense is there's there's two pieces to the to the presentations that we're going to hear, but I'll let you describe it, and then we'll get into a really good conversation with everybody. So, That's great. welcome. Great, thank you, Noam. Really appreciate it. Uh, I'm Brandon Pashovsky. I'm the Chief Data Officer at USAID, uh, and and just really appreciate the opportunity to be with you here today. Uh, we did engage with Interaction, as Noam said, in 2014 on something that at that time was called USAID's Open Data Policy. And we're really moving away from just talking about open data at this point to talking about sound, responsible data management in general throughout what we call the data management life cycle. So we have a different spin on things that you're going to hear because it's important to not just address one part of the, the data management life cycle, but to address the entire life cycle comprehensively. Do we have it all worked out? No, I'm, uh, okay. you know. I, I'm, I'm uh, unfortunately not able to claim that. However, I will say that I think we've matured quite a bit and this will be an ongoing process. And I have to say that Interaction did respond to that initial policy with a letter back to USAID providing feedback in 2014. And we've taken that very seriously and we'll, we hope you'll see some of those adjustments as we demonstrate some of the things we have for you here today. Um, I am joined by some very uh, important and valuable colleagues, Gail Gerard, our Chief Innovation Counsel uh, here. So if you have questions about data privacy and intellectual property, Gail is perfectly suited for that. Also, uh, Scott Thompson, Mason Thompson, Mason Scott Thompson, he has sure. two names. He's from Georgia. You have to have two names, right? Uh, but he's our lead data scientist. He's going to be providing a live drive, so to speak, of the development data library. Several other members from our team from data privacy to communications and, and the actual platform management folks are here in the, the room as well. So we can field all sorts of questions, which we're glad to do. But I, I'm sure various uh, folks are, are aware of USAID's work because you're, you're partners with us in so many cases, which we value deeply. But USAID obviously is, is the lead government agency that works around the world to save lives and reduce poverty, uh, bolster democratic governance and help respond to humanitarian crises around the world. We recognize that your organizations are on the front lines of doing that and we can't be successful as, as an agency without your work in these areas. Uh, and more importantly, what we are focusing on is, and Noam's absolutely right in this regard, so what our team does day in and day out is, figure, is, is wrestles with some of the tough questions of data management. How can we use the data that does come in from those field locations to better inform how we do development well, how we respond to humanitarian crises well. And some of you have probably heard our administrator's uh, refrain that he's uh, very fond of saying uh, right now, it's very important to emphasize that the purpose of foreign aid is to end its need to exist, which really does beg the question, how do you know when it's time to reduce or to eliminate foreign assistance? Well, that requires evidence and data to support that claim in a sense, right? And so the administrators noted that information, data, and knowledge really does help us uh, determine whether a country is more self-reliant, whether that country is increasingly committed to self-reliance and whether or not they have the capacity to be self-reliant. But that does beg the question of data. What 
kind of data will show us whether that's actually taking place. Just to give you some context, uh, the way that U USAID used to implement its programs by and large, we focused on receiving reports from our implementing, repart implementing partners around the world. And by reports, I really mean narratives, and narratives that were written out in words that made claims, and, and they may have charts and graphs and things like that. But just to kind of run through the process as a whole, what you see on the screen is at the top, USAID would provide funding through grants, cooperative agreements, and contracts to its partners, such as yourselves, who then implement international development programs around the world. And those programs intrinsically generate program data, which you see at the bottom of the screen. And the interesting thing, though, is sort of prior to the digital age, so to speak, USA being founded in the 60s, we'd really, uh, at that time, request the reports that you see here on the left side of the screen. We'd ask for those quarterly reports, those narratives, those annual reports. And there would be some data that would come into our corporate systems in terms of indicator data. But really the raw data, say at the community level, the district level, the village level, would often langu languish still in the field and die on laptops or end at the, the end of a, an award or a contract never to be seen again. And the reality is that that data is inc incredibly rich and can provide insight into how our programs are working and whether or not, and this is important, whether or not a community is becoming more self-reliant, more resilient. Is it now more educated than it was five years ago? Has the mortality rate decreased? Uh, is it more able to generate income? Is it more food secure? Where is the evidence of that at a community level? And that's the question at some level we're trying to answer and make sure that we can get our hands on that data and that you have that data in perpetuity as well if you end up working in a location that has historical data on it, for example. So just to give you some context, uh, how many of you recall the release of that initial policy in 2014? I'm just kind of curious. Most of the folks here in the room do, and presumably those of you are on the phone, we know the majority of you are on the phone or on the, the webinar. Um, and so we wanna recap that a little bit because you're probably here because you do remember that and you know there are implications and we want to work with you to make that, uh, make that work for all of us to the betterment of development. So in 2014, 2015, we did issue what we call fondly ADS 579 uh, because that's a beautiful name and we chose it for its aesthetic purposes. Um, but that really focused at that time on sharing data publicly uh, across uh, with the public and for research purposes and that sort of thing. And it did focus at some level on some protections for privacy, for uh, intellectual property, uh, and for uh, security reasons. And it did provide through a basic website at the time, a basic inventory of raw data sets that the agency was releasing. So you could kind of view that as a baby step in this new era of open data and machine readable uh, data for public release. We're now in the process of doing a full upgrade to that policy and in tandem with that we are so we are also launching this new development data library which we'll show you live in a moment but 2018-2019 we're seeing really is the era of curating data throughout the entire data management life cycle and recrafting that policy as we speak and that means starting to provide better guidelines for the planning to actually collect data data management plans for example uh, actually uh, providing standards for how data is collected uh, and then brought into the environment, curated, uh, annotated in terms of met metadata, analyzed, uh, stored for future use, and then ultimately disseminated and published for public use, or perhaps even uh, for restricted use for specialized research purposes. Uh, we're also upping our game at some level on a risk-based approach for uh, advanced protection. Things like the mosaic effect. Can you uh, combine data set A with data set B to generate insight or perhaps even re-identify an individual uh, and violate their privacy? Those are things that are on our radar. Uh, thinking about informed consent. What kind of consent was uh, gained from folks in specific uh, communities to actually use their data? After all, they are the ones who agreed to participate in our program. Are we uh, still holding true to our commitments to them and uh, abiding by our commitment to, uh, to respect what they've committed to and how their data would be used. We're also wanting to ensure that we're not simply slapping data up on a website, um, which, uh, you know, at some level, just publishing your data is the first step and getting data out there is not necessarily a bad thing in itself. However, we recognize the value of the research community throughout USAID and throughout uh, its implementing partner community. We know that in order to uh, publish with data that you've worked hard to generate uh, in academic and professional journals. You also need that data to be linked in a repository that's worthwhile and that can be trusted. And so we're really following a path toward trusted digital repository certification 
uh, Dr. Thompson, who's with us, who will do the, the actual demo of the DDL, and some of the other folks on our staff are PhDs in digital librarianship and digital curation, specifically so that we can ensure that the way we're distributing data is in a way that can be used for research purposes. So we're really trying to bolster uh, our efforts in that area as well. Since the release of that policy, um, I have to say the, the data that has come into the agency, I think it's just been unprecedented. The reality is that we've put a lot of time into upgrading the DDL and the amount of data that is currently public actually pales in comparison to what we can potentially make public. And so we're working through this sort of backlog of amazing stuff that has come in. But the things that have come into the DDL historically have, have been fascinating. Everything on land, year, land tenure in Ethiopia to health services in Ghana, education levels in India, microenterprise in Jordan, food security in, in Bangladesh, even genomic or geospatial data sets that provide really interesting insight into the kind of work we do, you know, drought resistant crop strains, for example, and how those things are working in food insecure environments. So as this data has come in, it's really been important not only for us to update the policy, but to update the technology by which we make that data available. And so moving into that, I'm gonna kind of transition. I'm expecting that Scott may need some lead time in terms of getting prepared. Are you ready to go on your side? <laughs> You're locked and loaded. All right, so we're gonna start moving it to Scott, but launching on November uh, 13th, when you go to data.usa.gov, the current URL is usa.gov slash data, you will see the new development data library and that will start showing up on your screen here shortly. Uh, but the entire idea is that there will be an entirely new look to that page with enhanced navigation. Uh, the ability to search for data sets more easily, to even uh, graph and visualize data sets dynamically within the platform itself, and even in some cases connect dynamically using uh, application programming interfaces. So that if you connect to a data set on the DDL, you want to embed a graphic on your site and you want it to be fed dynamically from that data set, you can do so. So the site you see on your screen is not a PowerPoint slide. This is the live site still behind the firewall. Uh, but if you check on November the 13th at data.usa.gov, this will be live. And without much further ado, I'll turn it over to Scott for a live demo, and then we'll uh, welcome your questions. So thank you. Thank you very much, Brandon. And we are just absolutely delighted to have the opportunity today to give you sort of the sneak preview right before the launch uh, of the new uh, development data library. So as Brandon highlighted, you know, at USAID, we're really focused on elevating uh, all of our development community's ability to manage data across a life cycle, right? From the point of when we're planning for our data management through collection to curation and archiving and then responsible publishing and sharing, right? And a digital repository uh, really has a central and critical role in that, uh, particularly our DDL. It is the agency's central data repository where we all kind of need to work together as a development community to do a couple of things, so some basic things. One is just preserve our data, right? Uh, make sure we're bringing it into a place where, where we can archive it and make sure that it's gonna uh, have integrity, stability. The next thing is to make it available, but not just now, but well into the future, right? And then finally, continue to enhance its usability as we all use it together over time. So, since 2014, since the policy was initially created uh, and directed USAID to have the development data library, what you see today uh, is sort of a, a placeholder, if you will, on the main website. And since that time, we've been trying to build uh, the DDL 2.0, uh, the new version of the platform you see today, based on all of your feedback, right, to help us meet those goals of strong data management, preservation, availability, and continued use. So we're delighted to show you the new site and the new features. Um, and the new features really boil down uh, to, to, to two large sort of buckets, right? We have a lot of features for data producers, for people producing and contributing data. And really, we are receiving that data and then curating it over the long term. And this is the detailed data, the data that underlie our metrics, that underlie our reports and studies, right? All of the wonderful, rich, detailed data that you and our partners are creating out in the field. And then we have a whole set of rich new features for our data end users, okay? The ability to enhance access to that data and then to start to enhance use of it and continue to enhance the usability of that data as we all work through it together over time. So what we're gonna do today is actually highlight a lot of those features uh, for you 
and walk through uh, all of this rich feature set for both end users and for contributors. And I particularly too want to highlight places um, where we have uh, really tried to work with all of our partners and our USC staff to understand at a granular level, uh, you know, what the needs are, what we've heard over those past couple of years to support, uh, you know, what we're all trying to do through ADS 579. So here we are, right on the homepage um, of the new DDL. As Brandon noted, um, the URL at launch will be data.usa.gov. Um, and right off the bat, um, right on the homepage, we can highlight some features where we're, we're really bringing together data producers and our end users, okay? But the idea that what we wanna do is bring that data in from our producers and hand it over to users, right? To connect the two. So for those of us producing data, right, you can see we have several places right off the homepage to start registering, submitting your data, and this title bar, this gray nav bar across the top for creating things anywhere in the system. As I scroll down, uh, you'll start to see things though for end users, right? So here we have a series of sector tiles. And if I were to click on one of these sector tiles, it's gonna go to the data catalog and give me a filtered view of data sets that are based on that sector. Then we have the ability to highlight individual data sets through data stories. This is a great opportunity uh, to highlight uh, you know, some of the great work um, that all of, all of you are doing and the data uh, that support that, right? <clears throat> so one thing I do want to point out um, right off the bat is that I am logged into the system currently. So when it goes live, when you come to the site, right, obviously you will not be logged in at that point and you will not have uh, an account for the system. When you come to the site up here on the upper right, there's just going to be a little sign in button, okay? Once you click on that, it will take you to, um, to a login screen, and right there is the opportunity to say, yes, I would like to sign up for an account for the DDL. And that will create um, a basic user account for you in the system. You verify it via uh, email, and you're right in. So there's no other additional steps to create a basic account. But we will talk through, as I go through the demo, uh, what you will need to do to receive what we call elevated privileges to be able to submit data, okay? <clears throat> so first, I want to highlight for you the types of data, right, that are going into the DDL and highlight for you how it's being presented to end users, because um, I think it's really important to understand exactly how it's discoverable, how it's searchable, what it looks like in the catalog, what data landing pages look like, so that when we actually walk through the submission process that I'm going to show you, you have context for it and you're thinking, ah, I'm doing this because it needs, you know, it's going to look this way in the catalog, or it's going to be presented this way in a metadata landing page. So if I go over to the data catalog, we can start to get a sense of how the DDL presents data and, uh, and how it's searchable and discoverable. Now, this is the development environment I'm in, so there's some test data and other things in here. This is not what it will look like when we launch the system. So you can see right over here, right, that we have a basic data catalog with a bunch of features to help you search for data, but also browse and discover data. So here's a search bar uh, that will enable you to search uh, on any term uh, that you would like. Uh, on the left-hand side of the screen, we have that faceted navigation, a series of filters that you can use to start to browse for data that might be of interest to you, right? <clears throat> so, you know, perhaps I'm interested in economic growth and agriculture, Right? If I select that filter, <clears throat> I'm going to see a lot of data sets that are tagged with the sector of agriculture. And perhaps, you know, I'm only interested in data sets that can provide me with gender disaggregated data, so I can select yes. <clears throat> and as soon as I do that, I'm provided uh, a filtered view of all of those uh, data sets that meet my criteria. Now, in the catalog itself, to help you understand uh, what data that might be relevant to you, what you're interested in, right, you get a basic uh, overview of each of, those, uh, each of those data sets or data resources. So we get a basic title, um, we get some keywords here, and then uh, we get a preview of the abstract. Right? We can also see when it was last updated and how many times it's been viewed. 
So when you're ready to actually select one of the data resources because it's of interest to you, if I go ahead and click on this, <clears throat> then it takes you directly to the metadata landing page for that individual data set. And I'm just going to walk through this really quickly so that, again, you have context. When we actually walk through a submission, you're going to see how this is created, how our data contributors, you, our implementing partners, are going to help us create this uh, to present to end users. So right off the bat on the metadata landing page, we have the title up front. We have uh, the abstract or description. <clears throat> and then as I scroll down, we see a lot of rich metadata. Okay, <clears throat> We see some things about the submission. We see some things um, about the USAID initiative, program cycle components. As I open this box to see more and scroll down, you see a lot of rich metadata here about this data set. <clears throat> Further down, you're seeing additional resources. Uh, these are things like code books, your informed consent language, maybe methodologies, right? Things that help an end user understand how to use this data properly. <clears throat> and then as I scroll further down, we begin to see the end results of submitting data, the data set file to the DDL or the new DDL platform. We start to see a preview of what's inside the data set right on the landing page. So it's <coughs> reading the number of rows, telling me uh, how many columns I have. Uh, we provided a value for what each row represents. We get a preview of the columns and you'll see some features where you can do some basic sort of display values in the system. Finally, as I scroll down, we actually get a preview into the data set itself. So we can actually begin to look inside the data set and understand whether it's going to be useful uh, for, my, for your individual purposes. And when you're ready to use these data and download them, you can use any of these features up top. You can export the data out into your favorite flavor, <clears throat> all mostly non-proprietary formats, CSV, XML. For developers, each data set has its own API, so you can hit the API to pull the data in programmatically. <clears throat> Again, I show you this up front because I want you to have good context uh, for when we walk through an actual um, submission process, right, a registration process. So let's dive right into that. I mean, that is really the heart of what we want to be able to show you um, as our implementing partners, as the people that are creating all these rich, incredible, valuable data in the field. We want to show you all those features that help you um, efficiently submit data to the DDL and how we can all work together to build these submissions. Okay. So if I go back to the home page here, actually, I want to go back over to our development instance to run this test and not do it in this other environment. <clears throat> You'll see um, <clears throat> right here two ways to begin a submission. Okay. You will always have this gray navigation bar across the top of your screen, and you can create from there. You can also use this register submit button right on the home page. <clears throat> okay. So you've created your account in the DDL. You have a basic account, right? But you are not yet uh, authorized to have uh, rights to submit data to the system automatically, right? And that is part, uh, in part for security purposes, right? We're all trying to elevate our ability to do data responsibly, right? And so we need to be able to validate uh, those folks who have the ability to authorization to see that data and to submit it into the system. So the first time that you click on register or submit, <clears throat> if you don't yet have what we call that partner privileges, right? You're going to get a little dialog box, and that's going to say, please register for a partner account to submit data to the DDL. As soon as you do that, there's a little form that comes up and we just ask for some basic information. Most of it has to do with um, your award, right? What award or awards are you working with? What operating unit are you working with? And some contact information for folks in this ID. As soon as that's submitted to us, uh, we take that in as the DDL admins, and then we verify with your operating unit or your COIOR. Um, that yes, fairly, you know, <clears throat> these folks are working with USAID on this program and need the ability to submit data to the system. Now, what I will say is that this requires some planning. This is, right, this is a manual process. So don't wait until, you know, Thursday before the Friday of the award and try and come and get that set up. It'll take a couple of days for us to reach <clears throat> out to the operating unit and then give you those rights and access. But once you have it, 
then you'll have it and we'll help you manage those rights over time. <clears throat> okay, so that'll be the first time you click on register or submit. That's how you'll get uh, your rights to, to a partner account. Once you have those elevated rights, when you click on one of those buttons, <clears throat> you're gonna receive a prompt. Now we have to pause a moment. And the system is asking us whether we wanna create a data asset or a data set, one of two things. This is really, really important. <clears throat> we heard from all of our partners and from our USAID staff that the DDL needs to provide some ability for us to organize our submissions based on how we all do our work in our business. We work on activities, we work on projects, groups of things, right? Not individual data sets. So think of the data asset as an organizing thing, as a bucket, okay? That is an activity level bucket that describes that activity. So my example here is maybe you have a baseline survey for maternal and child health in Ghana, right? The data asset is that thing that describes the survey, the whole survey, right? Now you might have 12 data sets, you might have 15 data sets, you might have 20 data sets that go with that activity, right? So the data sets are the actual individual files or individual objects, right? So it might be a data set file, a flat file on uh, child you know, nutrition in country. Then you might have another file that's on uh, some uh, you know, survey on household consumption, for instance, right? So each of those data sets will go in as a data set entry and they will be associated with that bucket to help us organize things and see this is the activity and these are the data sets that go with that activity, that go with that survey. <clears throat> so for the purposes of our demo today, let's assume that we already have a data asset in the system and we want to submit a data set, right? <clears throat> so I'm going to click on the data set button. <clears throat> And the first thing I have to do is I have to create just a basic title. I'm gonna iterate this. What we're gonna do today is we are going to enter or upload a data set that is a snapshot out of USAID's anti-corruption database. And we have data for programs that ended between 2006 and 2017. Jumping. Great. <clears throat> so as soon as I do that, I'm taken over to a draft, a draft page that's going to help me build this submission. It's going to help me create all the metadata that I need to, to perform the submission, and it's going to help me actually add or ingest the data as part of that and then submit it, right? So really quickly, We'll take a look at some of the features that help you build out this submission. Here are the actions I can take. I can start working on my metadata right here. I can add the data right here. And once I've added the data, I can actually do some configuration and editing. So as we build this submission, uh, we're going to see things populate right down here uh, as part of the submission form. <clears throat> and when we're ready to submit, This is going to turn blue. This is going to give me the ability to actually make that submission uh, to submit it for review. <clears throat> so the first thing that we want to do is we want to start creating our metadata. We want to add the metadata for the submission. <clears throat> so I'm not going to walk through all of these tabs right here today. I want to give you an overview of the metadata right itself, but I really want to highlight a couple of features inside the system. Again, and working with our partners and working with you and, and our USAID staff, highlighting those elements that uh, we know are of concern and we know you want the ability to be able to, to do in the system to manage and present our data responsibly. The first thing we got to talk about is responsible data, right? So we're really trying to do our due diligence here around elevating our ability to protect our data and take risk-based approaches to understand the risks that are in that data. <clears throat> so the very first thing that we have to do is we have to make sure that, of course, we are not submitting any classified information to the system. This is not the system for that. So we ask that you must uh, verify and certify that. And as soon as I do that, then I'm into the rest of the metadata workflow. I'm gonna come back to this tab because I wanna continue on the theme of responsible data. 
<clears throat> part of our metadata workflow really highlights our ability to understand the risk that these data submissions may present and then to help to work through what mitigations we could take, right, to try and make that data as available as we can, particularly given how useful it can be. So we've created a risk utility tab where we ask you, our partners, who know all these data the best, who know all the granularities in that to help us understand the risks that you see in the data so that we can take in that information and then analyze it, right, to help make that risk-informed decision. So first and foremost, uh, we do ask that you describe a little bit about what utility, what value is really in this data, right? We want to know that. We want to balance the risk with the, with the usefulness of the data, okay? Then we ask <clears throat> for the data set that you, the file that you're actually submitting, have you already transformed this data set from some original? And if so, what have you done, right? What have you already done to the data? And then we get into asking questions to help document the risk in the data set. Okay, surveys, does, does this data set contain information about individuals, right? A lot of the times the answer is probably gonna be yes, right? What types of individuals? And then the heart of the form, we're asking for you to help us identify those direct identifiers or indirect identifiers that remain in the data set. Now let's pause here. <clears throat> Almost every time, 9.99999% of the time, all direct identifiers, all PII should be removed from any of your, your submissions. Please, unless you are direct, you know, explicitly directed for some reason to do so, do not submit PII or direct identifiers into the system, right? So for that, we would uh, want you to follow the safe harbor rule, and that is hosted on the DDL FAQ site. There are 18 elements to direct identifier who would ask that you remove, if you redact those before submitting your data set, okay? That does not mean that you will uh, remove, you know, all granularity or all sensitivity in the data set. You still may have indirect identifiers in that data set, right? Those identifiers that when in combination put together could still present risk. And we really want you to document those as thoroughly as you can. So, right, if I click yes, we're asking, you know, what types of indirect identifiers are still in here. And we'd like for you to write a little narrative and tell us about the risk and the indirect identifiers. When you're based on your assessment of that risk, then you're able to propose an access level. Does it not present a lot of risk, therefore you would suggest public, or does it present a lot of risk, in which case you would select non-public. If you select anything other than public, we provide you a drop down for that rationale. You should provide a rationale as to why it should not be uh, made public. <clears throat> USAID will take in all of this great um, information about the risk. And uh, our wonderful colleague here, Erica, uh, is adding up our somewhat new uh, risk and privacy team. We actually have a risk and a privacy team that actually is gonna analyze this information and help us make a balanced decision based on risk and utility about how we can try and make these data sets as available as possible. <clears throat> so now back to less controversial metadata, <clears throat> uh, basic metadata right in the system that we need to help understand the data set. Here's our title. We can obviously edit it. We can add a brief description. Um, we'd like for you to identify who helped create this data set, right? We want people where possible to get credit. We understand that, that can present its own sensitivities. License, uh, the organization. Now, the second thing I want to highlight is, yeah, we're all busy. Right. Um, I love metadata. I mean, I, I just I just really love it. So I would probably spend all day entering this stuff, but I'm guessing you probably don't want to. So we give you the ability to copy, to use things as a template. Um, you can use a data set that you previously submitted or a data asset, that bucket. Right. So if I click on this mobile here, <clears throat> it's going to show me my recently created data assets and data sets. Well, uh, I'm testing inside the system, so I've got a lot of stuff in here. <clears throat> and I want to copy the metadata from the data asset, right? <clears throat> but what I also want to do is make sure that my data set that I'm submitting is directly associated with the activity, with the asset. So I can use this button here to make that this data asset the parent to associate it and to copy all the metadata. Populated. 
So as soon as I do that, <clears throat> all my metadata entries are pre-populated. You can see we have a status bar across the top here. And so all of these are now green, indicating that I've completed um, all of the metadata and that uh, it's all validated. If I didn't, you'd see one of these um, markers here, right? A, a red sign, a yield sign, asking you to go to that tab. <clears throat> all of these fields remain editable. So, you know, probably 80% of your metadata might be the same, but if this is a higher level description for an activity and you're submitting a data set, you might want to edit that description. You might want to edit some of the metadata. So you can go into these tabs and edit. So if I just click through a couple of these for you to uh, be able to see the metadata that we have, right? <clears throat> First off, we have some metadata that we're uh, looking for to help us manage uh, this data set submission, uh, operating unit of origin, uh, people who are registering the data set, CUR, AOR that you're working with, contacts at USA. It's an important tab, award information. <clears throat> that award number obviously is very key. It helps us link you know, data sets and things to other products like deck reports and other things. So we ask that you pay close attention to that. The data details tab. Here's the place to really describe uh, a lot of rich metadata that helps end users use that data set. So the first couple of things I want to highlight here have to do with those attachments or those additional references. This is a place to add the code book, right? And I would strongly urge you, the system will allow you to add, um, you know, the file type for the attachment uh, that you want. I would strongly encourage us all to use machine readable code books. So, you know, to the extent that you can do this in a CSV file, please do that. And um, not necessarily code books and PDFs, that would be great. Um, <clears throat> informed consent. Um, Here's the place to put the language, right? Or the questionnaire that was used uh, to seek informed consent. We need to know that if you're submitting data that is, you know, is uh, questions uh, or responses from individuals, um, A, that informed consent um, was obtained and what that language is. What, what did we make a promise to uh, those participants for, right? Were they aware that data you know, might be shared outside the study team once de-identified, right? And if any other things were said to them or promises made, we just need to know about that up front. <clears throat> other reference materials, if you have a methodology, right? Something like that, anything that really helps the user understand the data to use it well, we would ask that, you know, you try and provide that documentation. Again, you want to think that to yourself, in a way, I hope to never even have to meet or talk on the phone to somebody who's requesting my data. I can hand this over and they can immediately understand it. So as I scroll down, we have a series of other metadata fields, you know, the countries that this might apply to or sector designations, language, uh, some questions about if, if this deals with human subjects. Embargo, if you're working on research, right, the DDL has the capability for you to request an embargo for up to 12 months. So you're in a situation where you or colleagues or anybody is trying to get that peer review publication out, <clears throat> you can request an embargo. We do ask for a, a good description, you know, about that uh, and a proposed date. And then we're done. <clears throat> then we can finalize our metadata. <clears throat> I click on that. I end up right back at my draft page. And here we are. All of my metadata are populated. So now I can go in and review it. If I see anything that I don't like, I can always go back in and edit. So let me pause here a second to say, we know from feedback, right, that the current DDL, uh, that form is kind of problematic because you can't save it, right? You can't save it in progress. So here, at any point, you can save this as a draft at any point. And uh, it is easily accessible in your profile. So in your profile, you're gonna see an inventory of your stuff. And the little icons that say whether it's a draft or not. If you go back to that profile, if you save something, click on it, you'll end up right back at this page and you can take any of these actions. Scott, can I chime in yeah, for, for one thing? So it, this is probably a good juncture to ask why we just spent a lot of time on metadata, which there, when's the last time you had a meeting on metadata, right? Um, this, is, this is important for two reasons, because probably in terms of the folks on the call and the folks in the room, there are probably two camps. There's some there are some camps are saying please make this as simple as possible and just make just have a few metadata fields. There are others who are saying thank goodness USAID finally listened and we they put a lot of stuff in there about risk about embargo about data profiles uh, so that we can a make sure we protect our data b be able to cite our data and publish with it 
C, just handle it responsibly. So that's why we did a deep dive on that, just to show that we've been responsive to that. But the important caveat here is in terms of the required fields, which are actually required to fill out, we have tried to limit that as much as possible so that you're not forced into that box if you don't want to be. And so we also want to err, so we're trying to balance simplicity versus the robustness that some of our other partners have wanted. So yeah, thank you for that. I think it's, it's really, really important. Uh, there's always going to be that balance, right? As we all work out. And I, I do want to point out again, you know, thinking back to the catalog and thinking back to our discoverability, right? It is unfortunately only as good as the metadata that we provide for it, right? So we have to balance our efficiency and streamline, you know, the ability to get through this and the ability to provide rich information. So that will be uh, an ongoing thing. <clears throat> so now for the exciting part, uh, for the, the moment of actually adding the data, right? That's the moment we all want to see. Here's this action right here, right up front. Let's put some data in the system. When I click on that, I'm taken to this data ingest interface. And to add my data, I don't really want to spend a lot of time on it. I just want to put it in. So I can actually drag and drop right into the system. And there's my data. So it's really pretty much that uh, simple uh, in terms of uh, uploading the data uh, into the new DDL platform. So I want to highlight here that we are just uploading an object or a blob that I can't see. We're actually reading the data. We're ingesting it. So that has two really important features. One is it can help you at upload. We can actually start to do a little bit of quality control and data validation right here, okay? Um, it's reading my column names. It's determining what type of data uh, are in each of my columns, right? For unique ID, it's a number. For region, it's text. So it will even validate um, geospatial data, um, Boolean, true, false, right? So why is that important? Well, we can see errors now, right? That might uh, present a problem to end users that we might wanna clean up before we ingest the data. So right here, the system is showing me, I have two errors in this field, at least it believes it has two errors. So if I navigate to those errors, <clears throat> it will actually, take me to the two rows and highlight those, er those areas where the system has found an error. Right here, you can see that I have a dash in a number field, right? So I have text in a numeric column. So I can export those errors and fix them. I can try and fix them in the system. Um, a lot of times I think it's easier to go ahead and update your source file and it's just as easy as finding those errors, quickly making the correction in your source file, re-upload it. It'll just come right back into the system and, and revalidate it. Um, the one thing I will say about this, which is, I think is really important from a curation standpoint, if that happens and you make a change to a code or something, think about updating your code book too, right? Because we don't want a mismatch between those values in the code book. <clears throat> so that's the really important part of ingesting your data. Some quality control, some validation. And we're also going to show you another reason why ingesting is important. Because then we can actually start using the data inside the repository. Uh, through some basic uh, visualization features. Here on the left-hand panel, uh, I do have the ability to do some additional documentation about columns, about other things. Uh, I can even georeference the data, uh, a particular column, like if I have addresses or something. So in the interest of time, I'm not gonna correct these right here, we're just gonna save it. <clears throat> and now we're gonna go right back to that draft page. And if I scroll down, you can see uh, we have now put data into the system associated with this record. Here we have the columns, uh, what's in the data set, et cetera. <clears throat> so now we have metadata and we have data and we're able to submit for review. <clears throat> so the system quickly gives you the, act, the uh, inventory of the actions that occurred, right? So this is an in initial submission. So we've got, we've created the schema, we've added metadata, we've actually inserted the data, um, of course, you know, this is a nice feature. If you're actually editing a submission, it will show you those changes that you've made during the edit. <clears throat> I click continue. Now here again, you're presented with an option at the platform level. Uh, this again is a suggestion. Are you suggesting that the data is eventually going to be publicly available or private, right? So if you selected private on that other area, go ahead and at the platform level, select private. If you think restricted or non-public, private here, right? Um, again, I wanna highlight 
this button, it says submit for review, right? Not publish, not make publicly available. What we're, you're actually doing is submitting the data set, submitting the metadata, submitting the suggestion to USA DDL admins, and we work with our colleagues in USAID and our operating unit to review all of this and make that determination on the access level and the, and the visibility. So as soon as I hit that submit button, <clears throat> what's happening is now the system is gonna build my submission. <clears throat> and once it's done, I can then go and view my published page. And this is a little bit slower on the screen. Here we are, right back on that metadata landing page that we took a look at uh, from the catalog, right? So we're sort of connecting those endpoints, right? How you as a producer are moving through this creation process, creating that metadata landing page, working with us to do so, uh, and then literally presenting that out eventually to end users. So here's all of our metadata. As we scroll down, here's the preview into the data set itself. And at the top, we have the export function, okay? <clears throat> now, again, this is that moment, right? Once we actually create um, that data submission, uh, we work through um, our review of it, we're publishing it, right? As producers, you as partners who've created this rich data, we're trying to connect you to end users, whether that be other implementing partners, whether that be yourself in the future, right? And this, through this landing page, as you're building it, you're really building that connection, right? And passing that data over. <clears throat> so there's a lot of documentation here to help users understand the data. There's ability for them to be able to access and download the data through that export function, right? But the system also contains something else for end users, the ability to actually start using some of the data inside. Uh, the platform for those data that, that end users have access to. And we can do so through these uh, basic visualization features inside the platform. So the best way to give you an understanding of how that works is to walk through a quick demo of it. So here I am on a visualization interface, okay? Now we have data that we just uploaded um, that are for USAID anti-corruption projects that ended between 2006 and 2017. So let's take a look at a, at, at a basic you know, visualization of some of that information. Well, perhaps we want to see it by country, okay? So I'm going to select the dimension of country, and now when I do that, the system gives me options of what's available for that uh, particular variable uh, to create, right? So I can create basic bar charts, uh, pie charts, right? I can't do a map because you know, I don't have geo-referenced data here, or I don't have coordinate data to do that. <clears throat> but let's just create a basic uh, column chart. So we've added the dimension, right, along our x-axis, and now we need to select the measure, the value. What's our y value here? And maybe we want to look at award value by country. So here we go. Now we have basic award value uh, by country for anti-corruption projects that ended between 2006 and 2017. Okay, now this is kind of busy because we have all countries represented. Uh, maybe we want to filter this, and the data set actually contains regions. So if I select a region I'm interested in, I can create a filtered view. Lag in here. There we go. <clears throat> so now I have a visualization of anti corruption projects in, let's see what I select, Europe and Eurasia, right? <clears throat> Again, total values across um, 2006 to 2017. We're looking at sums. If I wanted to, I could take a look at. Um, other measures or other values. I could take a look at the basic median. I could take a look at the average, right? <clears throat> so this gives you the sense of what users can actually start doing with the data, right? The data that are provided and made accessible to them. And this shows just basic, uh, you know, simple descriptive statistic visualizations. But we also know that, you know, we want to do more visually appealing things and we all love maps, right? Everybody wants a map. 
So <clears throat> to highlight that, I'm going to show you very quickly the visualizations that you can create through mapping features. Uh, we've I've entered some uh, data, um, some geospatial data for uh, Haitian health facilities that were used to support relief during Hurricane Matthew. This is the data asset, the study level bucket. This is the actual data set itself here. And you can see that we have a featured visualization on the platform, which is a map. And I actually have some basic coordinate data uh, for those uh, healthcare facilities. And once you click on that, here we go. Now we have uh, the ability to display visually for that data, uh, the map of Haiti and the location of those facilities. Now it so happens that I actually have point data, so I can actually drill down, right? <clears throat> Keep going further. And eventually I'm gonna get to point data for those facilities. And then I can pull up the data that are associated with that individual point, right? <clears throat> so this feature, these features of some basic visualization and some mapping, I think, you know, really highlight how we're trying to continue to enhance the value around these data over time. And these are all your data, right? The rich data that you all are collecting, curating, managing um, as a result of your awards. And we want uh, all of you to be able to enhance its usability, provide it, make it accessible, um, and really get credit for all of the amazing, fantastic work um, that you're doing and showcase the valuable data products and how they can help with our development outcomes. So with that, um, that concludes our demo drive of the new DDL platform. Um, and I think uh, we're open to now for any questions, any granular questions you might have about the platform and its functionality, but then as the conversation evolves, uh, we'll broadly into, into to data issues. Absolutely, so thank you, Scott. We're gonna turn it back to our host. I think we've agreed to divide this into thirds. So a third of you know talking head overview, a third of the demo, and now a third on Q&A. If I scurry out at three o'clock, it's only because I have a call, but we're gonna give the full 30 minutes to Q&A. So uh, Noam and, and Ben, back to you, so yeah. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Brendan, and you yeah, for your work on this. Um, I think that, that there's probably a lot of different levels of questions that people might have <laughs> based on what you just presented to us. And I'm trying to think about how it might be useful to organize, um, because I, it would be unfortunate if our conversation goes from very detailed questions about inputting specific types of metadata to more philosophical questions on how the data are meant to be used or shared. So. What I would suggest is that maybe we start with the broader, just a, a question for the group to think about broader sets of questions. And then uh, in a little bit, as the conversation goes, we'll open it up to sort of some more of the, the detailed type questions. Does that make sense for sure. folks? Absolutely. All right, so um, I'll start here in the room just to see, and I'll, I'll also uh, come to the phone for anyone who has sort of broader questions around this data library and uh, the usage or sharing of data that, that's implied by this. Sure, please. Great. Um, and please introduce yourselves. Yes. And we didn't, there's so many people involved that we didn't introduce everybody around the room, but as you state your question, please take the moment to introduce yourself to our guests. I'm John Coonrod with The Hunger Project. And my question is, if I have data sets that aren't a result of a USAID award, yes. Can I put them here? So right now, the scope. So, so the question, just in case folks didn't hear it on the phone, is if I have data sets that are not the result of the USA project, can I put them here? The scope of this platform right now is to house USA funded data sets. So the black and white answer for the moment is no. There are other places you can put that, but right now it's USA funded data. And let me add that response though, um, because um, we, um, you know, we want to be good stewards of development data in general. Right, and we have a lot of folks on our team too, and growing capacity for, for data curation. So, where you are uh, looking for best practice repositories, right, for development data, I'm happy to answer those questions and help direct you to some of those other resources uh, that are are can help make sure that your data are safe and secure over the long term. But uh, so we want to continue that conversation just to take care of development data in general. 
and, and to piggyback on that question, though, on this question, so your answer was clear, but to the end goal of combining data sets, is it envisionable that that data from this could be identified as certain types of data and then sort of automated in an export function once data is shared here to something else that aggregates the data that you have from AID with other stuff. I'm, I'm just thinking about, you know, Interaction's been working for years on its NGO APAP work, right? Which which maps a lot, a lot of folks here probably have, take some of their programs and map them into that so that we can see where NGOs are working on a country basis or a sub-national level. But a lot of that, a lot of our membership, for example, does work that is completely outside of and not connected to the US government. Of the $15.4 billion that our action members marshal, about 24% is connected to government funding. So the question is, how can you potentially bring this stuff together? And is that part of a vision down the road or, or even within your system that enables somebody else to take it and export it somewhere else? So, so starting from the detail question, can, could you take it from the system and pull it into some other system and aggregate it through the APIs? The answer is yes, you could. To the question of does this place exist where something like a development data commons, right? Where you're pulling from World Bank and USAID and DFID and, and One Foundation and, and Gates Foundation, Omidyar, whoever, does that thing exist? Not to our knowledge. Now, if any of you are entrepreneurs and are thinking about something, it could be an idea. <laughs> But the reality is what we have right now are, so, are silos for, say, social science data, health data, things like that. But a commons for development data is still a sweet spot that hasn't really been explored. Um, but it is on our radar, and, and we're open to exploring something like that. That's very nice. Stop question down here, and then I'm going to turn to the phone for anyone who has a question there. Please introduce sure. yourself. Uh, Mustafa with Action Against Hunger. I think my question is a little bit linked to the first question. I wonder if there's a vision uh, to link DDL with the DEC Development Experience Clearinghouse, or there are other platforms which are available or through UCID, like the Foreign Assistance of GAP or the other platforms. I wonder if there's a kind of vision to link all these. Oh, goodness. Um, wow, you're really speaking my language now. The short answer is, gosh, yes. Oh, my goodness, yes. Um, so. USAID is a decades old organization. We're not the oldest organization in government, but that comes with baggage, which you know means that you've set up a data silo here and a document silo here and an indicator silo here. And so that is absolutely part of a vision that we're working on as we speak. Can I say that that's gonna launch next year? No. However, we are looking at a repository for digital objects. And the idea would be that if you have a document, a research publication that is supported by a data set, why keep those in two separate silos? You want them in the same environment. So the short answer is yes. We also have many other data products that are beyond the scope of this conversation, like Foreign Aid Explorer, IDEA. IDEA does happen to be third-party data from you know, Freedom House and other places. So we're looking at a vision for the future, which is, a USA data commons that in fact would bring those things together to tell the data informed story of USAID in a common environment. And that absolutely is on the radar. And I think too, you know, we have to do, we're very cognizant of doing this too, not just at the system level, right? But, but at the strategic and policy level, right? So, you know, when we talk about managing our data through a life cycle, um, we're very serious about finding and, and forefronting that framework, right? That helps manage the digital objects that we're producing as deliverables, right? How do we do the best we can for those to make sure that they're curated, we protect them, they're accessible, and then we continue to enhance, enhance their use. And we wanna do that, uh, you know, elevate our ability uh, as a community to have that, that framework, that strategic framework, and then reflect that in the, the architecture, the digital infrastructure that we're able to the, use as a tool to make that a reality. Thanks. I'm going to turn to the phone and see if anyone on the phone wants to jump in uh, with a question at sort of this level of uh, discussion. Yeah, um, I can I can read a couple questions oh, that came in. Yeah, uh, can I share two two ones? All right. Uh, first, will the policy still be retroactive, or is that aspect of the, the open data policy being revamped? So the policy as implemented in 2014 essentially said that if you have an active award as of October 1st, 2014, then you were presented with the option to sign a bilateral modification that said, we are now willing for that active award. And perhaps that active award had been going on for four years prior. So since 20, 
2010, right? So a 2010 to 2015 award, in that case, it would have been retroactive at that time. Well, presumably most of those five-year awards, at least in the past four years, most of those have come to an end. But moving forward, the reality is this is now the way we do business. So all new awards that are issued, again, from 2014 onward, will still have this, this requirement in it. Um, but no, we are not going to back to awards that, you know, predated, uh, say, 2010, 2012, 2011, and, and look at this back for historical data. That absolutely will not happen. So, yeah, one more. Um, based on the evolved thinking behind DDL 2.0, are there or will there be updates to the open data policy in terms of what types of project data need to be uploaded? So the answer to that is also yes. Um, as part of the initial presentation, we are revamping the entire data policy for the agency. And we intentionally entitled it USA Development Data because it's not intended, uh, it never really has been intended to be the open data policy, but the data policy for the agency. So what will remain unchanged uh, is a requirement to provide raw data funded by the American taxpayer back to USAID with the understanding that you can still use it. You have intellectual property rights to generate intellectual products using that data to generate publications, even to generate a profit using that data. But USAID also has the right uh, to request that and then publish it if it doesn't violate a privacy or safety uh, consideration. Those things will likely remain unchanged. Some of the things that we do anticipate updating are things such as uh, being more specific about what data must be redacted prior to submitting to the DDL. Right now we say you must remove personally identifiable information. But Scott mentioned something called the safe harbor method, which is how health information historically has been de-identified prior to sharing. We wanna be a little more specific about that. We also wanna be more specific about standards that might apply to geospatial data, for example. And so we will be uh, continuing to update that. The other thing I think that folks need to be aware of in, a, in interaction is in fact the, the forum to, to provide an update on this. Many of you are aware that we are pursuing the federal rulemaking process with regard to the open data rule uh, itself. Um, we've made a lot of progress on that. At the same time, uh, USAID is looking at several technology advancements uh, in the coming months and, and in 2019 with regard to submitting indicator data. There is a possibility now under discussion that we may want to have a consolidated rule that would simply apply to the submission of digital artifacts to USAID, whether or not it's a data set or like you said, a document to the Development Experience Clearinghouse. Just as we've had siloed technologies, would it not make more sense for our partners to have a consolidated technology and a consolidated rule set in terms of contractual obligations that make it very clear, this is the digital stuff that we need to submit to USA and it's all in one place. And so we're, we're perhaps looking at something more consolidated for efficiency purposes. Great. Okay, I'm, uh, um, I'm with uh, IRI. Um, I wanna take a step back to talk a little bit before the generation of the data sets. So ADS 579, uh, the language on their section one seems to put the earnest on the agreement officer representative to identify data, data sets during the project design or the work plan design in order to be uploaded to DDL. Um, in many cases, at least from my experience, that, that does not happen. Uh, I mean, yes, we engage with AORs, we have a lot of discussions, but the, it, it never comes up to to that point instead like, come, like a year into implementation and then like there's stuff like oh have you uploaded this or where's where's this data set but like this was never like agreed upon like at least when reading the ads it clearly says that they need to come up with or at least like take the initiative in, in identifying what needs to go up like in in, in that uh uh database uh so my question would be like how at the mission, like how is the, uh, this policy is perceived at the mission level? Like, are there any, uh, what kind of guidance is being given to like the missions on, on this subject? Yeah, so uh, we've had webinars uh, with regional missions, particularly when the policy was rolled out um, to sort of highlight the roles of various individuals. We actually have an internal USAID training, which is a, a video-based training in USAID University 
to sensitize uh, folks of the requirements of the policy. And a lot of that initial sensitization was done in 2014, 2015. Um, within any organization, there's flux and there's a time for renewal and more messaging, which we're actually starting to ramp up now. We just returned from a TDY to Cambodia and Nepal to refresh some of our folks there on those requirements. But I think more importantly, um, the, the issue we need to address is, is what we would call data management planning and uh, introducing the notion, uh, which Scott has really been leading and leading well, of introducing the concept of requiring data management plans in our awards where that is clearly defined. It's not just left up to an AO or a CO or COR, AOR uh, to do that, but actually in policy, there's a template that needs to be completed where you write down, this is how, what data we're going to generate. This is how we're going to manage it. And anything you want to add on that in terms of those components of the data management plan? Yeah, exactly. And I, part of, I love this question because I think, you know, it, it really highlights, you know, how this is it? How this is a process, right? How how we mature together, but but the the real importance of uh, of data management planning. And in fact, I have a whole bunch of slide decks for for trainings for both partners and for USAID staff on this topic. How do we plan for this? Because if we plan up front, as you know, a we know what we're submitting. We can agree on it. Uh, B um, we're prepared throughout the project in terms of resources and costs to manage the data in a way that it's easy to get this stuff in rather than having to worry about it at the last minute, right? So data management plans are a tool that have been around for a long time in the scientific and research community uh, that, that are variously worked out at different times within the, you know, the initiation uh, of an award. USAID, you can imagine it taking place during work plan, mel plan, right? Component, how, what are we expecting? The agreement, what are we expecting as digital deliverables? And that can, be revisited, right? And then how are we going to manage that data to get to this point? Submitting, curating the data efficiently, right? So the, where's the first place where that shows up in USAID's policy? Well, some of you may be aware of USAID's public access plan. Uh, so, you know, we have ADS 579, which is a, the development data policy. Now, federal agencies are also required to respond to um, uh, their plan for making the results of scientific research as publicly available as possible, just like the executive order over data does for other data types. So within USAID's public access plan, which talks about research data, that's the first place in basically USAID's directives where we see, yes, for research data, we got to do data management plans. And we expect as we work through, uh, you know, updates to 579 and other things, uh, fully to uh, formalize, you know, a data management plan process, provide tools, guides, resources, those types of things to be able to help our uh, AORs and CORs in our activity managers and program managers uh, in the field do just exactly what, what you're asking for. Yeah, and we want to get to as many questions as possible, but, but I really want to say this, this one thing that's, I think, very important. When, when we are asked to do, uh, to do what we did in 2014 by then Administrator Shaw, we're a small scrappy team in the single digits in terms of rolling this out, developing it, you know, implementing the whole ball of wax, communicating, change management training, everything. We're now a team of just over 50. And the, the agency has rallied behind what's, what's going on in this domain. And so, so Nicole leads our communications team just for data related issues. We have a training team. We have, uh, you know, Erica on privacy. I mean, this is all very new as we speak. You know, Robin is, is you know, the, the brains behind managing the DDL as the data comes in. The thing to emphasize is that there were baby steps taken in 2014 to start catching up with the state of the art on transparency and open data. Since then, we've seen the tidal wave of resources added behind this in terms of rolling out new technology but we're gonna absolutely commit to change management and additional communication and training as we move forward. Can I add something to that also is that um, the ADS 579, the automated directive system, that's USAID uh, internal policy. And so you as implementing partners do not need to follow ADS 579. That is publicly available for you to get an insight into the policies that apply to us. It's guidance to the AOR, CORs. You, look to the four corners of your document, right? And that's where your obligations arise in your agreement, not in the ADS. Again, it's a helpful tool, 
But um, so for us, in order to require a data management plan or any of the stuff, we need to get it into the agreement. And that's going to be a, a, a change to the, the different clauses that are in the agreement. Hi, um, what's the API like? Is this a REST API or is it just exports or how does the API work? Yeah, there's there's a, a RESTful API uh, and all the documentation uh, for how to use that is really richly documented here um, on the site. So um, when you're ready to start to go down that route, it's it's actually we're actually using part of the uh, API uh, ingest an ingest API actually um, to be able to bulk upload removing all the data right over from the old site when we launch into the new site. So uh, a lot of robust documentation, uh, and we're here to help um, support uh, all of that. And it's uh, well, some of the ones I've used. It's it's pretty robust. So let's actually take this opportunity and move into the more sort of technical or specific, based on what we what we saw. Uh, one general question on that that I'll ask is: you're log you're going live with this. You said next week. Um, the by what means are you? already thinking or exist embedded within the site itself to make the inevitable tweaks that you're going to want to make in terms of feedback as you because you this is like you know it's 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 ddl version 2.0 but it's really there's going to be many versions of this as you as you continue to improve it do, what's the feedback mechanism that you have built in yeah. to do that? Thank, thank you, uh, Noam. And you're also preaching Anne's language, which is engagement, 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 and Nicole's as well. Please engage with us. So right now, if you go, once you're logged in, you go to the help menu. If you don't mind hovering over that, Scott, that would be great. This is specifically uh, how this is, is organized now. You can do the typical thing like contact us via email or whatever, but you know, there's report a technical issue here that goes to GitHub their technical issues tracker that we'll be monitoring if you find bugs and tweaks and things like that and we'll engage with you and close those out there's ask the community here like hey i had this issue and anybody else have it that takes you to stack exchange these are sites that are actually approved for government use through terms of use and we've vetted that with gail and uh and, and that sort of thing there's also a user guide that we're working on as we speak we're putting fine finishing touches on that we also have an introductory video that's essentially saying, hey, welcome to the DDL. We know this feels new, feels like new clothes. We want to kind of give you a tour of how things look. So that's what we can do on that. Um, sorry, but if I can just stay in the... You can go back. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I do want to, I think there's some questions from the phone that are also on the technical specifics. So we'll come back. Okay. That's fine. Um, first of all, I've been working with you since 2014. So I'm Karen Levy Brown with NDI. And I just want to say this is great and the focus on data management plans is exactly where we as implementing partners should be going regardless of whether this exists or not. So thank you for making this uh, institutional priority also for us. Um, with regards to the data management plan, is there any um, opportunity to exempt or to request an exemption to transmission so we would acknowledge that this data set exists um, but certain things about whether informed consent is not possible to obtain or something like that is that being a consideration that that there would be an exemption to submit even though usaid has rights to it that's the first question and then the second question is once we submit, wouldn't the recipient want to know in advance what the access level is before we submit? Just because we're requesting it, you know, that seems like, oh, well, you told us that it was only going to be made to mm -hmm. internally, but we just found out that this data has gotten into hands and it and oh. there's been feedback. Um, so those are, and I have one more. And my third question is, um, you know, just as risk management plans are very dynamic, um, we hope that, you know, as you're thinking through guidelines for data management plans, that you're not thinking about sort of imposing what a data man made data management plan will look like, because different sectors have different types of data. And so while guidance about elements of what should be in a data management 
plan are always helpful, you know, to stay away from, because I can see certain missions saying, oh, and you have to fill out this form or, and you're trying to back into your program into something that was actually created for something else. Can I just, just to chime in on a few things and hit, hit things sort of rooftop level real quick, since okay. there are three things yeah. is, one of the things we've done on something like informed consent is put out some notional language yeah. that says, here's something to consider. And we want to be very clear because back to Gail's point, you're bound by the four corners of your right. contract. And so we can't impose some additional contractual regulation by posting it on our website and say, hey, follow this, right? Because that's not in your contract. What we are looking at is say a body of say useful materials or guidelines or yeah. best practices is to say, here's something to consider. However, if it's not in compliance with your contract, don't do it. You know, in other words, follow your contract. Here's something to consider as a framework for data management plan or as a framework for language to potentially use for informed consent, those kinds of things. And we want to vet that to make sure that we're still following, you know, staying within the lines of, of contractual obligations. On the other piece in terms of um, are you considering um, situations where the partner may propose an access level of non-public, right? only to find out USA didn't agree and then made it public, you're saying, well, wouldn't a partner want to know? That's a fair question. Um, as we are looking at, um, as we're looking at IRI and NDI setting next to each other, we, we get it. We're like, um, you know, but, we have our secret here. <laughs> yes, I, you probably know each other. Um, but, but we recognize the sensitivities of the data. That's why those are in there. One of the things that we wrote into the draft rule, again, we're having to think about some consolidation here that's taking frankly longer than even we would like, that if USAID were to make the access level something other than what you propose, would we provide a courtesy notification to you? That is something that we are considering. And, and to be good partners, that's something that even if we're not required to do, we would like to do even informally, perhaps, as part of that engagement. The final one I'm going to defer to Gail on because uh, we've heard it many, many times. Even the existing contracting language says, unless otherwise specified by the COR, AOR, then you must, right? We left that huge out for reasons such as this, but I know Gail has other thoughts. So. Well, yeah, and, and and I think, you know, four years ago, we didn't know a whole lot. It's It's shocking what we've learned since then. And a lot of that we've learned from you guys, right, as we've talked to hundreds and hundreds of people about this so and and the faqs which i see you printed oh. out here on um on usaid forward slash data First and second um, version yeah <laughs> I mean, that's that's where we're saying we've got this big caveat in the current rule that's in your your agreement this big caveat and that's the faqs are guidance to you as to what we intend to now allow you to fit through there and frankly it's also it's sort of ammunition for you to take to your cor co if you feel like they're not having the same understanding right so that's that's this is what we would ideally like to be in the okay. clause right but but we are working through rulemaking and there was a change in administration that sort of put that on hold and so we're still working through that process what i would say and it's a learning experience but but for, for at the end of the, when you're about to submit it and to say, oh, actually we can't submit this because our informed consent clause doesn't allow us to do so, is not a good excuse. That should have come up at the very beginning. Now, if you're in a situation where you are working with your IRB and they are saying that your informed consent clause in order for them to agree to your protocols must have this language, then you're like, oh crap, if it does, I will be violating the terms of my award. I better go to my CO, COR now, AOAOR now, in order before I even move it forward. Mm -hmm. um, you know, technically we could say, oh, you can't update the data. That's a breach of the award. So can you give us all the money back, right? Now we're probably not going to do that, but <laughs> but let's not even get in that situation right. where you know you've signed up to in the four corners of your award in the same way you don't have to follow the ads with because you can rely on the four corners you have signed the four corners so make sure you can comply with that and if you can't come to us we don't want to put anyone's safety in, in or even the program's efficiency in jeopardy mm -hmm. right so come to us ahead of time yeah yeah and we're starting to include sort of in our risk management plans also the the vulnerability that it, you know, having this data come out. So we're actually connecting yeah. those in theory we are, but, okay, thank you. Then do you want to jump in with others? Yeah, yeah, a couple questions about um, like accounts and, and access. So first question is, 
is a partner account assigned to an individual or is it to an organization? Uh, and then a, a sort of similar question is, um, how are users going to be vetted and access granted? Are organizations going to get a chance to veto access from alleged members of the organization they don't recognize? And can organizations veto submissions from staff members the organization doesn't want to enter data by themselves? Whoa. Well, something new came on the radar. That's kind of cool. Um, I had the same question yeah. on, the, okay. on the validation uh -huh. question of how do you validate because in, the, mm -hmm. in an era of disinformation, yeah. mm -hmm. what are the protections and safeguards yeah. against that in your validation process? So some of this factors into the um, fairly arcane world of federal security requirements for information technology systems and very authentication and authorization, um, which I won't get into. The, the short answer right now is that when you request a partner account, you go in and you fill out a form. And that is assigned to an individual. You say, this is my name, this is my organization, this is my work email address, private email address is considered PII, we don't ask for that. Um, and this is the award number, right? This is my a formal affiliation with USAID. That then goes to the COR, AOR for your award, somebody in the organization that can vouch for you and say, Yes, I do recognize Karen, and that is the email address at which I correspond with her. And yes, this is the award to which she's assigned. Okay, guys, you know, go ahead and and, and give her access. That's how we're doing it now. That is not the preferred way. It's somewhat manual, um, but the the real vetting is going on between the person who signs up and says, "I think I should be submitting," and the COR. So if the COR allows them in, then they're in. The, the future of this is that um, there is a site called login.gov um, that the, the OMB GSA is actually maintaining to help bring authentication and verification up to the 21st century. We are eventually looking at moving to login.gov for the DDL. That way, if Gnome goes in, you know, I have to submit his baby photos or, you know, DNA samples or whatever it is through login.gov. I haven't, I haven't uh, dived into that. Um, completely yet, but we are looking at that for other systems. But the bottom line is that would be a U.S. government sanctioned way to authenticate the identity of an individual, and that's where we'd like to move uh, in, in years ahead. And, and I'm just going to highlight the fact that <clears throat> per those security requirements, right, um, group emails are not unfortunately secure, right? We don't have traceability for somebody that might for any reason take a malicious action inside the system and also the organization itself wouldn't have that visibility as to what happened so for those purposes traceability accountability we do have to have uh, the individual um, you know in the system so does so do you have to log register each time you have a new award so you're no, because oh, no. it's, it's connected to a word number, though, is it not? So that's what, so that's what I missed. The data it's, set is. Yeah, so what you would do is Scott was mentioning this thing called a data asset, which is a container, right? You may have multiple data sets under that award. Um, the reality is, is, is if your account is active, you know, and, and you've created an account, and month one, you go in and you submit a data set under one award, then you can go in the next day or the next month and submit another data set under another award. That's not a problem. For security reasons, your account will expire if not used after 90 days. After 90 days, that's a federal requirement. Not fun, doesn't make any of us happy, um, but that's a security reason, so that, that will happen. But multiple awards, multiple data sets is totally fine. For a question that I had about multiple data sets was batch uploading or batch downloading you know if you're if the metadata for us for multiple data sets is functionally similar is there a way to do that for organizations so they're not literally creating a new thing every time and similarly if you're an end user could you go in and basically pull down like a whole set of data sets that meet certain requirements so two things, two things on that. One thing that um, geez, it's 2:59, and the my, the three o'clock call will actually truly allow us to launch the DDL. So I have to get that call. Um, I mean, we're we're pretty much in the clear, but I've got to get to that call. Um, the, the thing I will say, and you're in good hands with Scott and Gail on some some other questions. Uh, if 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 you have the liberty to go over, the thing I will say is 
what Scott did show you is that if you create an asset, right, a container, and that has the metadata in it, then you could submit data set after data set and just copy all that metadata over automatically so that it carries through to make your life easier. So, you know, true, true batch upload, right? The ability to, to do that. I don't, right now the system does not have, um, <clears throat> there is an ingest API. Um, I know, you know, we're able to use that ingest API as administrators. Um, we'd have to do some, you know, user testing to see if we could, you know, do something like that. Right now, the answer is probably, at least in the initial stages, not yet, right? Yeah. To be able to do that. Is that on the roadmap? Yeah. It's yeah. the kind of thing that people through the help function and saying, hey, are you having this problem could raise. Well, I, I realize that, that time is, is, is short and you do have to get on this call. We do want you to get on that phone call. I want to test so people can start getting in there and playing with it. And uh, on behalf of everyone, let's just say, I'd like to say thank you. Thank you. Uh, to for all of you for the work, the commercial work that, that you do and for coming here today to share it with us. So, thank you very much. much. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Thanks all. Thank And if, if you guys are willing to hang around for a few minutes, those who are not on that call, if people have other questions just on the margins, maybe we can take those for a few minutes. Thank you.